and welcome to the second installment of Oda Conversations. Glad that you're here. Yesterday, we posted a video featuring Dr. Sheena Oliver and a panel of experts profiling the benefits of the new IdiomSense platform. I encourage you to check it out. We got a lot of great feedback, so keep it coming. Today, we're going to shift focus a bit and talk about, well, for starters, is there a connection between World War II and the field of audiology? In the next few minutes, you'll learn not only about what soldiers with hearing loss taught us about our fundamental connection to the world, but also why soft speech booster might be more important than you think. Considering adding tinnitus management to your practice offering? In the coming video, Dr. Donald Shum provides us with some important insights into the nature of sensory neural hearing loss, as well as strategies that work when treating patients with tinnitus. Our cognitive system was developed to do a specific job. And that specific job was to tell the person what's happening in the world around them. Back in the early days of man, it was based on very primitive sort of needs. What are the threats in my environment? What could eat me, right? What are the opportunities in my environment? Where are food? Where is a suitable mate for me? That's what the cognitive system was developed to do early on. As humans have evolved and developed over the centuries, it's become a more sophisticated system. But it does get back to the primary function of the cognitive system is to take all that information that's coming in, all that input that's coming into the brain, and piece it together and tell the person what's going on in the world around them. The field of audiology became formalized back in the second half of the 1940s. And it became a necessary field because there was many veterans returning from World War II who had lost their hearing. And one of the observations that was being made by the medical staff was that there was a lot of depression and anxiety that was building up in these veterans who were coming back after losing their hearing. And it seems like, well, that should be pretty obvious what's going on. But they wanted to make sure that they truly understood what was going on with this loss of hearing in these veterans. So they contracted with a psychologist named Donald Ramsdell to look into it, to do interviews with these veterans and to really put some sort of structure to the knowledge that we're gaining about the loss of hearing, this rapid loss of hearing. And if you don't get the sound of an environment to be consistent with all the other sensations you have in the environment, then the, the senses can't coalesce together. The world we experience should match the world in which we exist. What we know as professionals is that sensory neural hearing loss can throw this off. Creating sensory neural hearing loss can give us a restricted access to the full world of sound, including, very importantly, the soft parts of the speech signal at various different input levels. Even if we hear the sound coming up through a disordered peripheral auditory system, we know that, that, that the patients have to put in extra effort in order to hear the sound. Normal hearing individuals, once sound gets above threshold, it starts off as feeling very so sounding very soft, and then moderately soft, and then moderate and moderately loud, and then loud. And we always assumed that patients with sensory neural hearing loss went through those same steps. One of the things that these two researchers pointed out is that's not always true that there is a concept called softness in perception that they introduced into the, uh, into the nomenclature that we use. And what it said was that many patients with sensory neural hearing loss don't experience sounds right above threshold as being truly soft. They're already sounding moderate to the patient. Even for an overall moderate input level, so a conversational level of speech, the high frequency parts of conversational level speech are actually soft. That's the soft parts of speech. And as you know, that's really re where the really good stuff in speech occurs. As you know, the real good information in the speech signal is that mid to high frequency information. And that's soft speech. So when we talk about soft speech booster, it's not just about soft overall levels of speech. It's about soft and moderate overall levels of speech. So let's go back to this data and say, okay, how often are patients, are, are patients in environments where they're listening to both soft and overall moderate levels of speech? And it turns out to be over 75% of the time. Here is one potential cause of tinnitus. There's many that have been postulated, 
but I just wanted to use it just as an example. Okay. The auditory system, especially the, century, the central auditory system, is a very highly balanced, highly calibrated system. There's a lot of nerve fibers that are firing all the time. And one of the effects that keeps the central auditory system in balance is the idea of inhibition. That there are some nerve fibers in the auditory system whose job it is is to suppress the response of other fibers, kind of keep them under control. And so one of the postulated causes of tinnitus, and again, like I said, it's not the only one, is the fact that when you don't get this normal input from the periphery, that somehow you throw out this balance of excitatory and inhibitory functions within the auditory system, so some of these nerve cells that were kept under control and being tamped down all of a sudden are free to just fire whenever they want. The people who've been working in the area of tinnitus for a number of years and are really experts in the area say the key to tinnitus and the experience that the patient has is how the person responds to the presence of tinnitus. It is a physiological change, it is a physiological condition, but the key is emotionally how does the person respond to the presence of tinnitus. There are many patients who have tinnitus where it's just there and they deal with it and it's no big deal. But those patients who are most difficult to help find a good solution are those patients in many cases where their emotional response to tinnitus becomes very, very strong. And most modern treatments of tinnitus, and again, if you know tinnitus well, you know this already, but most modern approaches to tinnitus deal with the idea of having the person learn to live with the tinnitus. That they use either some combination of maskers or combination devices, like our products now with tinnitus sound support, to do some uh, inhibition training, to do some relaxation training, to just get to the patient to a point where they don't notice the tinnitus as much. It goes from a conscious awareness to a subconscious awareness. That they may use relaxation therapy to help the patient just not be bothered as much by it. But all of these approaches have a strong counseling component. And if you're considering the concept of trying to bring more and more tinnitus patients into your practice because you see that as a good growth opportunity, if you're gonna do it, I absolutely, absolutely will tell you, you have to be willing to understand the counseling approach and really be willing to go in with both feet about the counseling side of tinnitus. I love what Don said that if you don't get the sound of an environment to be consistent with other sensations, then the senses can't coalesce. So the flexibility and versatility that you'll find, for instance, in our soft speech booster settings are there to help you give your patients a natural sounding world. If you're intrigued, interested, and would like to hear more, click on the link below. Let's see what we have in store for you tomorrow. When CFCs were banned, that's the chemical that used to make aerosols, squirt, that this product went from going to going and the customers started to complain, it's not working. It's not as strong as it used to be. It no longer does anything for me. So they spent a lot of money repackaging Lynx, Axe, uh, it's Lynx in the UK, Axe in the rest of the world. And now the product goes again and it's working fine again. So the sound of the product packaging affects how well people think the actual product is working on them. Thanks for joining the Oda Conversation. More to come tomorrow. See you then.